Welcome, my name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, NoSQL, Growing Up at Oracle, sponsored today by Oracle. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Joining us today is Robert Green, the NoSQL Product Manager at Oracle. Robert Green is a Principal Product Manager Strategist for Oracle's NoSQL Database Technology. Prior to Oracle, he was the VP of Technology for a NoSQL Database company, Versant Corporation, where he set the strategy for alignment with big data technology trends resulting in the acquisition of the company by Actian Corp in 2012. Robert has been an active member of both commercial and open source initiatives in the NoSQL and object, and object relational mapping spaces for the past 18 years, developing software, leading project teams, authoring articles, and presenting at major conferences on these topics. In his previous life, Robert was an electronic engineer developing first-generation wireless speed, spread spectrum-based security systems. And with that, I will give the floor to Robert to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Take your time. I'm going to talk about uh, NoSQL today, in, in particular, um, what's driving NoSQL uh, data management needs, um, what are some of the lessons that we've been learning here over the last couple of years at Oracle as we've been uh, putting technology out into our customer base, and talk a little bit about what we see in terms of uh, the features and the architecture that's becoming really important and that we think is going to be something which is going to have a, a lasting value to data management professional. So I'll start here with uh, talking about these modern workloads. So um, there's, a, there's a new workload which is hitting us, which is different than it used to be in the past, and that's driving a lot of the NoSQL uh, activities. And really, what it is, it's it's more of a write-intensive workload. It, if you look back at the at the uh, more Oracle business systems, it was a lot of reading that was going on. It was pretty much, you know, 5% writes. You had a lot of people oftentimes putting data in uh, these systems, and then there was a lot of read activity that was going on and utilizing those, those systems. Where today, uh, you a big shift to, to a much more write intensive um, type of workload, which is needing to be highly concurrent, and so at the same time, um, there's a new for highly available systems. So let's talk about these workloads. Um, the classic case that uh, I think everyone is familiar with is, is Amazon, um, you know, which is in the um, which is in the retail section uh, industry. And so you would think that this is a, a very very read intensive activity, going to a website, browsing around, and and actually buying something. But as it turns out. Uh, because of the way that uh, that these retail sites are trying to understand the consumer base, it's also a very, very write-intensive uh, type application. So as you're clicking around from page to page, uh, monitoring what's going on with that activity and, and capturing all that data, um, capturing the activities, as is, is well as eventually plating baskets for you, and then even doing things like trying to figure out whether or not there's fraud activities going on. So um, they're taking a look at what you're doing in your activity and comparing that to things that have gone on in the past. So you get this very mixed workload between reads and writes. And what that's doing is it's it's also at the same time driving a, a change in the, the concurrency requirements of the systems that are responding to that. And when we when we look at the the implications of that on the database implementation, what we find is that it's it's much more difficult to deal with that kind of massive concurrency when you've you've got tons of who are uh, both writing and reading your uh, your data ultimately in the back end um, because the the implementation of of the older relational uh, database is is such that it's doing this runtime uh, calculation of the relationships and because it's doing this runtime calculation of the relationships it's it's having to deal with um so with much more complex 
into structures in order to materialize that set of relationships. And, and when you're trying to write that at the same time, you end up having to do typically more than one I.O. operation in order to get the, that right in effect. So there's, there's probably indexes and other things that are being maintained. And because you're drawing the relationship between two data by value, you're often updating more than one table, uh, which ultimately will become a, a, a data that you join on later on, on in, in read access. And so it's, it's just a lot, there's a lot more going on there in terms of code path. So what we did is uh, that people are, in order to deal with the, you know, this, this mixed 50-50 kind of workload in highly concurrent conditions, they're moving to a much simpler data model. Um, for some of the applications where this makes sense. And it ends up looking much more like what we see on the right. Just a simple uh, keys, set of keys which are pointing uh, to a set of values. And, and basically the, the, the values are pre -gen. So they're, the, the is, is aggregated together in such a way that you, you use single type of I.O. operations in order to get the information out. It's, uh, it's more navigational for a join top, type of operation. And also, these workloads need to be available. And, and what we mean by that is, is, is sort of built in. I mean, people are expecting this kind of built-in, high available capability in their data management platforms. And you know, this, this stuff clearly is available in uh, in related technology as well. And uh, but it, it's usually an option. It's something which you add on, and it gives you some additional capability, which uh, allows you to you know, improve the, uh, perfor the, the performance of your uh, reports by, or I should say, retain the performance of your operational systems by offloading things for reporting. Um, and, and if you're willing to, you know, go away, you can, you can get things like active, active, uh, distributed relational sets as well. But you, you have to set this stuff up in, in addition to the original uh, database deployment and enable it. Where with the the new systems in the NoSQL space, people just expect this stuff to be always on uh, right out of the box. Everything built in, all the administration online, all the evolution of the schema online, any kind of upgrades, any kind of patching, any stuff should happen uh, while the system is fully operational and running. In order to get these characteristics, it, it, the system architecture becomes really the key in order to achieve these things. And so you've seen that shift for NoSQL systems. And you start looking at uh, characteristics like the ability to scale linearly, by scaling out, uh, replicating data for reliability and for higher concurrency on, on reaccess, um, changing the way that your transaction semantics are done by uh, more of an asynchronous type of uh, access model, and uh, and ultimately even um, doing things where even though you're distributing things across lots of systems, you look for ways to get data localization. So looking at this, uh, the you know these set of, of characteristics, this linear scaling, uh, often deploying sharded architectures where your data is split out across multiple processes that reside on multiple machines, and it gives you some sort of isolation so that if you have any kind of failures, uh, that the, the system would keep running. And the way that it does that is it not only spreads the data out in an automatic way across uh, these multiple processes, but it also then replicates that data. And, uh, and by replicating the data, you have multiple copies, and you can implement the software system in such a way that, that a particular process goes down, one of the other processes can sort of take over for some of the operations that were being handled um, uh, by other processes. And oftentimes, we're also seeing, at least in the Oracle NoSQL database uh, architecture, uh, you're seeing the introduction of one process which is sort of elected to deal with the transactionality of the system. Um, and so, write operations are typically directed at and driven through that, which then and replicate out to other nodes. And, and when the system, when it comes to reading, a client can read from, from any node in the system because the, uh, the is is you know being located to lots of spots 
and you can sort of choose how it is that you want to access that data in terms of its consistency, uh, which we'll talk about further on in, in, in the uh, presentation. The point here is that if you get these systems, these NoSQL systems, more hardware, uh, they will elastically expand. They balance the data uh, that's being managed by the system, and they will, in essence, uh, improve your SLAs, improve your write throughput by giving you a, a, a broader number of processes that are considered data and give you a larger number of processes that you can read from, so reducing your read latencies. And it's all just built into these NoSQL systems. Now, the other thing important about the architecture is this, this number of, of performing operations in an asynchronous manner. I see this as well very commonly across many of the vendors. Uh, you to choose things uh, in terms of durability so that you, um, you necessarily have to do full synchronous type of operations and sync data out to disk. And and we see it's delivered for these systems so that you get both a, a base, a basically available soft, eventually consistent type of operation by being just able to write things into memory and asynchronously return and expecting the data system to take care of the rest of the durability. Uh, to the point where you can you can also specify a, a, a full sort of acid transaction, and in which case you you will you'll things like blocking and pushing things all the way out into the disk subsystem. You get this spectrum where you can you can choose the kind of durability that you want. And on the read side, it's the same thing. You can you can say I I just want to read you know whatever the latest status is of, of data in the database, and I don't care that it's one consistent and just give it to me from any memory space that's bonding uh, the, mo the, the most rapidly. Um, you could say, no, I absolutely need to make sure that I'm getting a consistent read, in which case uh, you know, things get flushed and your operations get directed in such a way that you know you're going to get uh, a consistent result on read. And then finally, data local. We talked about these architectures um, trying to optimize I.O. in such a way that while you're sharding things and processes, you, um, you are, are trying to take this navigational set of data and, and localize it into the same physical nodes. Because that way, uh, when you direct a request uh, where, where you, you get you know, sort of a root level uh, PETA along with a bunch of related items, uh, we're having to, to you know, do, do the calculated join across the system. It's navigational. It's all related. It may, it may even be embedded into the same data structure, and so it's a very efficient I/O operation to read things out. But what's also important, and is not necessarily the case, but what is important is if you're if you're trying to do things like um, add secondary indexing, to be able to also localize your indexes to where your data is at, because if you can if you can do that. Then, once again, you get to optimize on I.O., um, work I.O. as well as disk I.O., and also at the same time, you get some ancillary benefits that um, you don't get, for example, an, uh, the possibility of index divergence, where something is going wrong when you're, you're updating uh, your data and your index from in, in separate aspects of the system, and a machine fails, or you know, something goes wrong, and you know the systems are, are meant to be resilient. They'll switch over, and other processes will continue to handle requests. But you can get this divergence between index structures in your data. So you you, you to get those things localized into the same uh, box. And then at the same time, that uh, you can get much more effective indexing. So you can have low cardinality index results. Uh, you're not implementing things as, for example, uh, just another distributed distributed preference table inside your underlying distributed system, uh, but implementing it as a real index uh, that's that's localized to the data that you're that you're eating. So uh, you can you know you can find you know the the three locality matches out of uh, 400 million uh, record slash value data set uh, pretty easily and effectively. And you can still do things getting system wide ordering because if you if you keep the indexes local, you can keep the ordering local. And so all you have to do is a quick sort merge at the client in order to get system-wide ordered result sets, which are, are typically very useful for 
for <laughs> for programming a lot of applications. So the idea of having the distributed architecture, but yet getting a, a data local um, a storage becomes really, really important. Also, at the same time, this is, is, is gives you a way to, to, to induce transactionality at some level across values by by having this kind of data localization. So that was just sort of a brief overview of, of you know BCC has been driving things right. There's re, there's a real change in workload. Things are much more concurrent. There's that, this expectation about systems being always on. So your architecture is playing a, a significant role in helping deliver that kind of a system. And so as we've We've built that kind of system, and, and others have built that kind of system, and we've been doing this now for, for a couple of years. We've, we're, we're seeing some things, uh, learning some things, and, and applying the, what, what learned into you know, future design work. And so let's talk about that a little bit. So key things that we'll talk about in terms of lessons learned. I mean, first of all, we, we gave the Amazon case, which is the web retail case. So let's talk about the fact that it's, this has gone, it's way beyond web retail, and, and uh, we'll talk about the reasons why. And, and the, the fact that these systems don't stand alone, they, they often involve a lot of other type of data management technologies so that need to be integrated. And then a little bit about the fact that they're really easy to get started with, and you can achieve some amazing things uh, in first-level designs. But but one one of the issues that is coming up is that as you go to extend these systems later on, and you go to version two, version three, version four, and you're trying to add use cases in, uh, you know they they can have some challenges because it's, it's very difficult to foresee all of the use cases up front when you do your data modeling. So the um, web retail. Space. I mean, we see the manufacturing automation industry using this technology a lot. And basically, there's sensors all over the place that are having to capture uh, uh, staging data. You know, wh wh at what stage are uh, various products in the manufacturing cycle, and what is the health of the of the system uh, that that is that manufacturing automation? We things in terms of real time dashboarding, uh, whether it's a business operations dashboarding or Real-time trading, where you know you're, you're to, to capture all the rights that are going on with the, from a, a track activity, but at the same time you're trying to read uh, that activity back over a period of time in order to understand trends. So you've got again that mixed work workload, both write and reads. Uh, we're seeing, you know, it, it would be you know, that in, in logistics, logistics management, where you've got uh, real-time assets that are moving around. And your needs to ma match up, you know, assets with with uh, with demand, and and doing dispatching basically to to put those things together. So a lot of areas where you see again this need to have a, a real time visualization of what's going on uh, with your system. And NoSQL tends to be, to be playing a pretty strong role in that area. We see oil and gas. Uh, this is another case of sensor analysis. Uh, we're seeing it, you know, for example, in the drills, where you know they're, they're trying to understand that this is horizontal drilling and uh, think that what's going on with the drills and you know how, how aggressively they can push to drill, drill further, drill deeper. Um, we're also seeing it on the discovery side, you know, ships that are you know, they're uh, through the oceans and they're dragging these big long lines behind them with sensors that are. Bouncing, you know, wavelengths off of the ocean floors to figure out, you know, where the ideal drilling spots are, and so there's this, you know, massive sort of sensor data uh, capture and analysis that has to go on. Or it's much more write intensive. They're actually doing a lot of analysis after the fact, but it, it suits well for NoSQL-based systems because it's it's a very high-intensity data capture, which is a kind of a time time analysis, time series analysis component to it, and these systems tend to very well for that kind of a uh, use case, um, and then we see it in personalization, mobile personalization. So it's yeah, this is somewhat related to retail these days, but, but um, we see uh, we see these these telecom providers 
for example, that are uh, exposing uh, um, capabilities up into to consumer-based applications that are on the mobile devices. So they're doing analysis of what's going on with uh, the overall mobile population and building profiles and, and then allowing retailers to work with them in order to push customized content up in, into the apps that are developed uh, telecom providers. Uh, we see multi marketing. We see you know people who are um, yet yeah, taking in data from various retailers and doing market segmentation on that, um, and, and trying to use that information to to both mobile personalization as well as as web based personalization uh, in the ad space, uh, and even some you know print print type of media. So it's like the point that we're is that we're, we're, we've seen this. Although no sequel started in the in retail space, the online retail space, we're really seeing it uh, push well beyond that into pretty much every vertical market: finance and banking, um, in fraud, in, in various other areas. Which is what I want to talk about here um, in order to, to help uh, articulate the integration story. So in the not, what we're seeing with these NoSQL systems is that they just don't stand alone. And I don't know that that should be unexpected, but it's about to be the case that many applications that are, are they're being fronted by NoSQL because you get this real low latency uh, characteristic, which is important to people um, in consumer-facing applications. But the back end of these systems, it's this is sort of the emergence uh, or the you know the big data segment <laughs> where you know it's hard to define what big data is, but it's it's leveraging data for uh, um, you know a much much more I would organizationally real time purpose where you're you're getting data from a lot of different sources now public data repositories streaming data from consumer sites um, you know places where you just didn't use your data before like web logs and all that. And you're, you're doing analysis on it and capturing patterns, capturing rules, capturing uh, uh, different segmentation analysis that's important. And you end up pushing all that stuff up into the NoSQL database systems where you get real-time response. But it's an it's an integrated notation. It's not like uh, you know the, the uh, these things are are sitting alone. It's the back end systems are gathering data from lots of different sources. They're pushing this, uh, it's, in this case, it's a, a fraud system up into a sort of rules up into a NoSQL database. And so, as, as new transactions are coming in, as, as people are wiping their cards, coming back in, and it's pulling the history of, of activities up for that card, and it's, and it's looking at all the rules that were produced by the external systems, and it's making a new decision, right? So it's, it's capturing that new activity, it's having to do a write, and at the time it's doing a pretty intensive read and analysis to figure out how to respond to that. And over time, that, that new information, that the new activities that are going on in that system are also written then into these, uh, to the data warehouse, um, which, which oftentimes is a relational-based data warehouse, but it's also, it ends up being Hadoop Basins because you know, oftentimes you're looking for long trends which involve a lot of data, especially in things like fraud, where in order to see the important patterns that emerge over time, you have to look at more, uh, you have to look at larger and larger data sets. And so, you know, having um, systems which can sort of true uh, very large data and things like that as a whole across the system. Uh, it w works very well in systems like Hadoop. So all these technologies start to work together. And so you, you need your NoSQL system to be integrated in such a way that it can work well with these technologies. Finally, as we talked about, the, the fit, you just don't know all of your use cases up front. And that be starts to become a bit of an issue. And it's in, just impacting the overall designs of the technologies. So <clears throat> a, a, an easy example is uh, I'm in a system where, you know, it's it's the classic IMDB, and, you know, you go in 
and you want to look at everything related to some particular scene, an episode of of movie, uh, because it's your favorite. And so you, it's very you can understand how that fits really, really well into a NoSQL database because you've got this hierarchy of data from the seasons to all the episodes, the actors, and, and all the other data that's that's relevant to that episode. And you can store all that, that stuff as, as some sort of nested data. When you go to get it, it's a low-impact I.O. operation to, to get all the data and pull it out, and then, boom, you can materialize it in various ways uh, for the end user of the system. But what it is later on, you come back and some, some business user requests that you add a new capability and they, hey, you know, I, I want to, you know, that this, these people really liked this series and this movie and it, it was all because they, they thought this particular actor did a really good job. So now they want to know uh, what are all the other movies that this actor is in. And if you, if you hadn't anticipated that, you probably would not have modeled it in such a way that you could easily do that in a NoSQL system. And it becomes very burdensome to go back after the fact in a kind of use case because you've denormalized your actors and your actors are sitting in you know all of the various movies that they're um, that they're archically related to, but but there's there's no way to get sort of that cross system look at uh, at all the movies that that particular actor belongs to. Uh, because it's it's the other direction in the data model, and so you know in relational systems it's pretty easy to, to you know to add that capability to add another uh, an SQL query you know to because your runtime binding these these data sets together and and it's fairly trivial. But with a NoSQL database, it's it's a do. And so you know those are some of the things that we're realizing, and that's where you see features evolving in the technology. Which, which are helping it do some of these uh, add-on use cases uh, in a more simple way, but the the burden is still there. The the challenge is still there if you step too far outside of the, um, of the you know, more more simplistic type of use cases. So we're seeing this convergence on essential capabilities for NoSQL technology, which are helping deal with again these. These loads, um, the, the fact that architectures being in such a way that it can that it can support these workloads, and the fact that it has some particular implication on, on uh, the types of use cases that, that these things are really well suited for. Um, there's a, a sort of things that have been changing over the last, I'd say, 18 months or so in particular, um, that is happening across the spectrum of vendors in the NoSQL space. And we think you'll see more of that, and it's it's important because the ones that are moving in these directions will, we think, be testing NoSQL technologies. Um, one is, uh, is is transactions. Transactions have in the past been very important, and they continue to be important. And you know, there's there's evidence of that. We'll talk about. There's more of a move towards standards. Just surprisingly, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, embracing of, of SQL, it's it's sort of coming full circle, um, and leveraging indexes, secondary indexes. Security has become very important, even the NoSQL technologies, as uh, as institutions like you know as, like Bank start to use this technology. They they're demanding more and more uh, security capabilities in the systems, and this built-in high availability. The availability is one is one kick that's important for the system, but the notion of, of all being highly available for um, for disaster recovery and, and also for localization of access, since so many corporations are are, are global in nature, uh, and their consumers, their users, uh, tend to be um, not just local as to one continent. So, on the traction side. It, you were, it's being evidenced by uh, Google is doing. If you look at Spanner and if you look at F1 and, and read the, those papers, you know one of the major things that they're doing is basically they're taking big table and they're and they're reintroducing transactionality into that so uh, that you can get a, a prop transaction even in uh, a globally distributed database environment. Uh, they're doing that because they found it was very difficult. Uh, 
for some corner set of use cases uh, to have transactions. And, and what we, we're calling this the 5% case. You know, having a base, base available soft state, eventually consistent system, is really good for a large number of operations. But we need the transaction. It's very, very difficult to, to deal with not doing that. So the, the, the kind of coding that you have to put in place uh, becomes, becomes enormously complex. And so, so by having transactions, you get the simplification of the development process. But you get simplification of business processes because oftentimes your soft systems can't completely compensate for the fact that uh, some what should a transaction goes bad. And so you have real physical processes. You've got you know, systems that have to go out and check things and cross-check and make sure that things are synced up. And then if, if it's not, you know, somebody has to take an action to get in and, you know, some data somewhere and decide what is right, what is wrong. Uh, and so, you know, you eliminate that. You get a lot of process improvement by having the ability to, when you really need them, do some transactions. Talk about index divergence. If you have a system where you really need, you know, uh, results. You, you you do a search. You, you can't afford to have some of your data not not fit under that index and, and not materializing itself in results. And you can't afford the overhead because you're dealing with very very large data sets. To so your indexes and rebuild them all the time. Transactions become important in that. Just overall data consistency. So so you see this materializing and in, in and what they're trying to do with with Manhattan, you see it happening at Google, uh, you, you see a, a, another very, very brand new, new SQL, no SQL entrants into the market, which are also introducing transactions, because they're, they're important, and you'll see more of that, and they're a very important part of lasting no SQL solutions. Um, the other thing you see is, is a convergence back to tables. You know, even in the key value space, it's become, you know, it's, it's Sometimes it's difficult to conceptually to do data modeling, and uh, and so in order to to help people with that, there's been this sort of abstraction away from the storage model and the, the end user sort of meta model overlay that that uh, that showing itself in the APIs. You can you can do all kinds of interesting storage uh, um, imitations, right, and 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 get a very interesting, you know, column-oriented type of storage and compression and, and you know, agro serialized, you know, storage capability. You can you can all kinds of different ways to get at and improve an underlying storage and retrieval mechanism. Um, you may even, you know, be things like, like building some dedicated to SSDs, for example, and completely bypassing memory operations. Lots of choices. But how you materialize that to the end user, how they interact with the system, how they conceptually data model, um, it, it, you know, people are really, really comfortable with this notion of tables. And so you've seen that come out uh, over the last eight, eight, eight months or so. You see more and more of the, of the implementations uh, using a table metaphor. And that, so, so not only do you get the improvement in data modeling, data modeling, but you also Start to get improvements in integration capabilities. So, when do these systems need to act? Uh, need to uh, interact with result systems, for example, and it has to move. You know, market segmentation data and all it has to move from one system to the next. And updates that are happening in the NoSQL system needs to move um, back into one of these more structured systems. Uh, you know, because you're talking table metaphors on both sides, it's much easier to implement um, the integration and transformation layers. And we can start to move back to uh, more of an SQL type of query. And, and you, you see many of the NoSQL solutions that are out there coming back to uh, SQL sort of query since because ultimately, you, you, as, as you add more use cases, you, you end up needing this way to, to declaratively say what it is that you want out of your database that's separate from, from it, its actual storage implementation. And I mean, if if you don't use SQL, you end up inventing something that looks very much like SQL. So you know, uh, anybody in the world already knows SQL. So it seems to be coming back around to that, um, that way of accessing your data, even though it's fundamentally a very different architecture. 
architecture. Very different um, cases that are being supported, different workloads. Still, oftentimes, the access methodology is, is moving its way back to, to uh, SQL. This one, um, even more important, I see these working together to deliver a solution, and then you're, you start getting to the point where you're wanting to do real-time analysis across the systems. You're wanting to do SQL extensions, getting both your relational technology, um, either Hadoop and your SQL database at the same time, right? If you, if you can find a way to create a unification of the um, query language across these different computational uh, paradigms and, and you know, database technology paradigms, then you're going you're gonna to be able to much more effectively turn out value to uh, the application space. Uh, so even though we have tables here, the, the vendors, you know, the value that NoSQL brought in terms of late binding in terms of schema and the application decide what is it that I actually just read at the database under my key or, or under my index um, and it's not getting all caught up in the fact that you're missing some some fields. Uh, that still is existing. So it, we're, that, you're losing that by going to the table model. You're just getting a much more effective way to, uh, you know, the integration modeling and, and access. Um, of course, you're introducing structure now. So in, if it were a, a, forget about document stores for a minute, but if it were a pure key values store, it's very difficult to add indexes if, if you don't have structure, right? So once you introduce the tables, now you, you have structure again to your data, even the soft schema, then it's, it's, it's a, um, a very fitting structure. You can adding indexes, and then you can leverage those indexes in trees that, that weren't modeled through the key space. Uh, at the beginning, or, or weren't modeled through what ends up being table hierarchies uh, when you've when you've got a, a table type of model. And to represent JSON in these things as well, because you know, if if you have hierarchically related table structures, then you have nested JSON documents. So it's really easy to take JSON, uh, which is the 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 most popular uh, representation that's flung back and forth across you know people's JavaScript clients these days, and and many systems. Quite frankly, it's a, just a easier to use XML, um, and have that stuff just come back and, and easily morph into a table representation. So again, not getting caught up in what the uh, what the meta model is that the end users are, are using versus the um, uh, the storage cons the, the storage implementation or the API implementation. Lastly, we talked about things needing to be more and more secure, and and this is you see all of the NoSQL vendors pushing further and further into security features, you know, past uh, authentication and, and secure wire protocol and uh, you know SSL and and push to authorization so that you can start to and again here's where you need structure here's where you need that notion maybe of a table or some kind of structure so that you can say, ah, you know, I want to give some user access to this my data, this set of tables, this set of structures, um, and give other users access to that, and then being able to control that on a more and more granular basis. And beyond that, auditing, I think, uh, it can be used, especially in the financial industries, uh, to be important, uh, as, as you'll see more in more of these technologies as they um, as they stay around, uh, will will get stronger and stronger in these areas. So in those, uh, I, I talking about what we see as a lasting NoSQL technology is a technology which is fairly simple in terms of its key value access uh, facilitates the distributed architecture, the architecture that we talked about, which is going to help deliver that, that write, read workload under high concurrency. Um, it, it's, but yet not getting caught up in the uh, again, storage implementation versus the end user uh, interfaces. And so having that basic key value distribution, uh, providing more user-friendly um, 
layer of access in that distributed architecture. Has to be highly concurrent capable and comes with the sharding, right? That comes with the replication. It comes with the ability to uh, to build these things and expand them into larger clusters as you uh, as you need to maintain SLAs and as more data goes into the system or more concurrent users hits the system, be able to throw more data at it and keep that that SLA going over higher concurrency um, requirements. Integrate as we talked about with uh, with these other technologies like Hadoop and your relational databases. Very few, we found very few of these applications that are completely isolated. And I'm not saying that there aren't any because there are. There have been in in uh, we've we've seen in high the ingest sensor data capture in logistics and, and some of the uh, some of the mentoring stuff that were there there are completely dedicated in those SQL systems. But even in those even in some of those places where it, it looks like it's just gonna be high speed sensor to capture, or, you know, if it's manufacturing processes typically when manufacturing um, the complete it fill inventories and inventories tie into billing systems and so that ends up being these tiebacks into systems and so you need you need a NoSQL technology which is uh, integrated and working well uh, with with all of the data management technologies. And the is uh, you know that's some throw in there. These systems being really complex, highly distributed, uh, the more automation, the more manageable they are um, across the board. So not so many moving pieces, not you know different technologies which are put together and on different versions and then it's hard to upgrade one without knowing the dependency is on the other, et cetera. If you start seeing these, these the limitations uh to those issues so that when you want to do an upgrade from you know version one to version two or you know from between patch releases, you yeah, with the click of a button and not have to think about at all how is it that I manage that process. What server should go first or second or third, but just have the system them tear that for you. So I'm coming towards the end here, where, I, where I'd like to open it up for questions. But you know, it, the, we're doing this on behalf of Oracle. I'm talking about the NoSQL space in general, but I'd like to give a quick plug for Oracle NoSQL database. Um, is many of the things that we just talked about. It's it's an advanced Q type of database. And when we say it's a key value database, well, it, it, it holds the notion of tables, though, in implementation that's exposed to an end user. So you get to think about things like primary keys. There's some other concepts that go in there to help you with the automation of, of distribution, um, like your keys that become a, a port of your primary key. Um, but it deals with things like data locality. So things sharded into, into a, a particular uh, space and, and and data that's related hierarchically gets brought along with that, and you get the choice of fully embedding data or whether you you want to localize but yet still links because maybe you're you're been some more interesting access um, uh, like this, the the use case we talked about where the actor needs to look up and find all the movies that he's in and you know, doing other kinds of uh, uh, searches on indexes and supporting both event assistant and, and full Acid transactions. We really care. We call it an advanced key value database because we don't really care what the value is. It can be binary, it can be JSON, it can be um, uh, Taylor in nature. We we extract that away, and and what we focus on is the architecture, which gets you the ability and the scale out and the data center support and and all of that stuff that's important to these technologies and allow you to pretty much store anything you need to that that warrants the, the kind of technology to help you manage the that workloads uh, that turn to SQL technology use. Community, we'd encourage you to get involved, and then I'd like to open it up and uh, and take some questions. Robert, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. We have a lot of questions coming in already, which is great. I'll give everyone a couple minutes here. Uh, one of the most important uh, key questions that comes in is if people are going to get 
copies of the slides and the recording. And again, I'll send those out within two business days. So by the end of day, Thursday, I will get that out to everybody along with this nice list of information there that Robert's showing right now. Um, and also, just to let everyone know that you have been, as a registrant, you're entered to win a pass to our NoSQL Now conference, which will be held in San Jose in August, August 20, starting August 21st. Oracle, of course, is a platinum sponsor, and you can meet Robert in person. Uh, so, to get the question started, Robert, let me uh, start at the top here. Our are auto sh um, charting algorithms built into these systems? If so, are there advantages of one algorithm over another? So, uh, so yes, they are built into these systems. Uh, you know, I, I really wouldn't say you know if if one particular algorithm is better than another. I think most people are are using a regular MD5 hash. So it's it just you know what becomes important is how can your system uh, how you can your system read itself and rebalance the data underneath? Because otherwise you can end up with hot spots in the data, and so it, it, that part of the implementation seems to be more important than the actual charting algorithm. Uh, but but I know that uh, uh, there are implementations out there which are also doing things like uh, providing uh, key prefixes so that you as a technique to not just auto shard, but kind of uh, give a little bit of localization to the data. Um, you know, you know, for example, prepend prepend your key space with the U.S. or uh, you know, DE for Germany or CA for Canada or whatever. And and so then data in these different regions all sharded overall, it ends up localized regionally into um, from a center perspective. Uh, for, for localized access, uh, so a little bit of a roundabout answer, but the, uh, again, the most important thing is the sim system implementation, so that you can avoid uh, hot spots by um, balancing the system when it needs to scale. Very nice. And the next one is a bit more of a comment than a question, but maybe you have something you'd like to add to it. I, uh, I, the comment is, I always consider the database technology to be a soft schema. It is the policies of the organization and a few bad practices, uh, simple examples select from that made database rigid. You can add to that? So, um, so what I add to that is th there's an element of truth to that statement in that it's not like you can't add a column to a relational database and and that uh, have and eventually expose that up into the application. So uh, and in fact, you can even implement things in such a way that you're using uh, you're using maps and you're using other higher level structures that sort of mask some of the underlying structures so that uh, so that you you can add new new uh, keys and values into maps basically but you know the end user perspective it's just a map so now there's there's more things that they get to deal with you could be storing that in relational structures but but in general you know you you have to go back out and change the application one way or the other and so the relational side you have to go back out you have to make sure that all of your SQL statements um, have the right ordering and are consistent now with the with the columns uh, and and on the no, in the NoSQL space, you have to go out and you have to do something to um, to recognize the fact that there's more data there that you might want to use, and so there's more application logic that has to get written in. So it's, it's nothing is for free here. There's an, there's definitely an element of, of truth to that to that statement. Um, but I can tell you that you know from the NoSQL space perspective, you you can simply change the schema just like that, and you don't break any applications. So the applications which are running against the older schema aren't going to start having errors. They're not going to start dying. And, you know, that's really the goal. And if, if the implementation is done well, you won't see any ill effect because you changed the schema. Whereas in the relational space, it's it's a lot, it's much harder to do that. Uh, be really careful because of the way that, the, that there's order dependencies on the SQL statements and things like that. And depending on your dialect of SQL, um, you can get into more or less trouble. So you know, there is better flexibility in the NoSQL systems from uh, from that perspective, but it's but nothing is for free. <laughs> that was it there. Uh, uh, so 
the question is along those, uh, those lines. Are visualization tools typically built into NoSQL technologies or additional visualization tools required? Yeah, I, uh, visualization. Um, so operational visualization tools, things like the real-time dashboarding, uh, that, that's typically not built into the products, and there are other technologies which, um, which come to bear to, to do that. But from an operational perspective and a management perspective, all, I think all of the vendors have some sort of visualization capabilities, which uh, allow to look at the statistics of the database itself and its operations. And 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 if they have their own console, then uh, the, like Oracle, they probably have standards-based statistics capabilities. So they're producing AMX or SNMP. Um, Staff that that can get wired into other tools very very easily. So hopefully answer the question. There's sort of two elements to that. You know what? Obviously on the end user data. No, that's other third parties that ultimately people um, specialist build for their apps. And then and there's the internal tooling stuff, which most of us have. Perfect. And, uh, next question is not necessarily Oracle related, but an interesting question. Have you, Robert, have, have you had any experience with a property graph database, and do you see it as a lasting NoSQL technology? Yes, I do. Um, and I, I know I didn't talk about that very much in this presentation, so that's a great question. And, and in fact, uh, Oracle has a, a graph capability, Oracle Spatial and Graph, which is RDF, but not property graphs, so it's, it's a RDF tuples. Um, and, uh, uh, and they're in the process of implementing graphs as well, right? So it's, it's in the plan. It's, 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 it's part of the um, product planning. So I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I can't say exactly what date that thing will come out. But it's, I think it's a representation of data access and use, which is, um, which is not traditional and important and, and emerging. When, when it's the relationships between data that becomes the focal point for the kinds of questions that you want to ask, and not so much the, the data itself. Uh, the graph technologies are very interesting, and they and they they work really really well to solve that class of problems. And so I, I do think that they are lasting technologies that will be around. And so Oracle Spatial and Graph actually works on of Oracle's NoSQL database. So that I know I didn't talk about it in. The presentation here, but that's one, one more example of how we, we talk about abstracting away the, um, you know, the, the storage and uh, uh, from API that the end user is, is experiencing, right? So it's very easy to, to uh, represent graphical models in a key value type of underlying storage structure. Right. That's great. Some great information. Um, and I'll get out to the information on that particular database as well. And what is the downside of implementing key value schema in an RDBMS? Well, I, you know, I think that the the only downside is, is probably cost. Right? And part of what this is this evolution of technology also um, it came about because of cost. There was nothing that prevented Amazon from implementing. There in a, a single table sharded um, implementation, you know, in Oracle, and they're huge Oracle users, right? So uh, related database users, they come on that. Um, and the, the downsides are the same kind of downsides that you have in maybe early you know, SQL technology, which is if it's just a key blob, well, you know, then if you want to access something in a different way later on. It, but, but it's a blob, you know, well, how do you do that? Now, well, now you need to start introducing structure so that, you know, you have metadata overlays that help you deal with that, right? And, and, and you can do it, right? But then you have to ask yourself, why? But when you have such a simple access pattern and a simple data model suffices, um, you know, uh, why premium you pay for having this awesome some awesome data management uh, computational platform that can do amazing things. I mean, what what you do with the relational databases are are, are just phenomenal, right? But but you don't necessarily need all that power for the kind of workload 
and the kind of access pattern that people are deploying these NoSQL technologies for. So it's, it, it's, it's really ends up being cost more than anything else. I love these questions. Um, and the next one is, do you think NoSQL seems to be adding regular RD, RDBMS functionality? Uh, eventually, will they both be merged? I'm I, I, sorry. I, I missed the, the question. Can you repeat it? Do you think since, uh, NoSQL seems to be adding regular RDBMS functionality, do you think eventually they will both be merged? Oh no, um, that's I, I. So yes, that's a complicated question. Yes and no. Um, that's part of why we're you know having this web is to give people a feel for where you know quite frankly uh, I think the related database will take on be the other way around. It'll take on a number of capabilities that will that will allow it to subsume what goes on with some of the NoSQL technologies these days, and and in particular. You know, saw the relational database um, can a lot of the XML capabilities and bring XML management into play that that that, that eventually kind of stop that market from getting interesting. Uh, I think the same thing you'll see happen quite quite honestly in the uh, pure document space. Right? I think dedicated document management type of databases will, will still be interesting. You know, when they're specifically addressing that issue, but but sometimes people are using these technologies. Um, really, a relational database will will, will do just fine. It's, so it's not it's not a use case where the the workloads are really demanding this this stream you know fifty fifty read write operations and and high concurrency and those those things that really drive a NoSQL workload. So I see the database relational database taking on some of those things that people are 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 putting to their NoSQL now. For for lots of very practical reasons, as they as they become more um, in tune with what they're really good for, but there's this class of NoSQL which I, we're talking about here today, which is really servicing this special, you know, simplified access patterns, nothing more than basic where clauses and index access, but in large distributed scale, you know, uh, um, type of systems where you have this this 50/50 kind of read-write workload. And um, and you know, under high concurrency that and, and the availability side of it is just you know everybody is moving towards that you know no SQL and and SQL systems are 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 pushing the availability envelope so so I so I, I see them uh, not becoming the same thing they're good. these two systems will remain uh, separate yet integrated each handling the kind of workload that they're most suited to handle. And the SQL side will, will clearly, I think, the key value, um, and even the graph workloads will remain important and relevant, and those systems will, will remain, you know, identifiable as separate systems. And, and some of the some of the other stuff that's going on out there, um, I think, will get uh, consumed by the relational capabilities. And we are just running out of time and just wrapping it up, and, of course, we get another um Question: Reminder that I will be sending out a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides from this presentation as well as the recording and all the additional information provided. Or anything final words you want to wrap up with? Just thanking the audience for their time. Uh, you know, everybody I know is very busy, and hopefully you got some value out of this. Uh, feel free to you know please join our our community and. Uh, reach out, and I, I'm happy to answer uh, other questions uh, if you have them. So, I, again, appreciate your time. Thank you. And, Robert, and again, and, and let me reiterate Robert's sentiment, and, and thanks to everyone who's attending and all these fantastic questions that came through today. And just a reminder that you can meet Robert in person at NoSQL Now, happening in Jose, August 21st. Um, so, I hope we can see everybody there. Uh, and again, I'll get that email out to everyone by end of day Thursday. I'm tight already. Um, have a, hope everyone has a great day. And Robert, thank you again for this fantastic presentation.